Perfect. Wonderful. So what I wanted to do was just do a quick introduction to, to meet the team. Um, so I am Katie Collins. Uh, I think some of you may know me, uh, others may not. So just as a, a brief introduction, I'm a senior account executive here at 3Kit. Um, I'm based in London, uh, but look after EMEA. Um, I've got a background in CPQ. Um, I'll come on to why that might be a little relevant later on. Um, but I previously worked for two CPQ companies at Big Machines and at Steelbrick. Uh, Phil, perhaps you'd like to uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, of course, Katie. Uh, hello, everybody on the phone. My name is Phil Bradison. I'm uh, a senior solution engineer here with 3Kit. Uh, like Katie and, and many of the teams here, I've spent my career in product configuration uh, and digital commerce solutions. So um, Big Machines, then Oracle, and, and uh, most recently Salesforce CPQ. So it's a pleasure. Thanks, Phil. And over to Lauren. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren. I lead alliances globally for 3 Um We do have partner programs in place for anybody who might be interested to learn more. I'll share my details at the conclusion of the call. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So wanted to provide a little bit of an introduction now to 3Kit. Um, we'll spend maybe 15 minutes or so going through uh, an overview, uh, but we'd like to spend the majority of the time going through some demos and some live examples to sweep the appetite. So at a very high level, uh, 3Kit specializes in enhancing customer experiences through the use of product visualization. So that sounds very exciting uh, and very fancy, I hope, but let's go into a little bit more about what that really means. So 3Kit actually started out in the wonderful world of Hollywood. So our founder is a guy called Ben Houston. Um, some of you may know him or may have heard of him. He actually specialized in the world of CGI and visual special effects and has uh, amazingly worked on movies such as Avatar, Superman, Harry Potter. I, I believe he also did some work on Game of Thrones quite recently. Um, so an, an amazing, amazing level of experience there. Ben decided to take his experience um, to another, another path, uh, especially when the world of commerce and WebGL was changing. Um, so this is where 3Kit was then founded. In 2018, we were very fortunate to get some investment from a guy called Goddard Abel. Again, some of you may have heard of Goddard. Uh, for those that haven't, Goddard is a serial entrepreneur and has invested in four companies throughout the duration of his career so far. The first was a company called Big Machines, which both Phil and I mentioned uh, at the beginning. And Big Machines was a company that specialized in CPQ, uh, configuration price and quote, which was acquired by Oracle. The second company was uh, Steelbrick, again, a CPQ company, which was acquired by Salesforce. Uh, the, the third company is G2 Crowd, which is still around uh, today, alive and kicking. And the fourth is 3Kit. The reason why I like to highlight that is from Goddard's uh, investment and strategy, uh, there is a unity between Ben's foundation and 3D expertise and, and folks that he knows in that industry with the strategy and foundation of CPQ. So it becomes a very, very powerful uh, unity of knowledge and understanding uh, which has now helped to, to drive the growth and development of 3Kit, which we're incredibly excited for. So wanted just to share some of our customers. Um, we do work across a variety of different industries, uh, furniture, apparel, manufacturing, etc. cetera. Um, this is not limited. Um, so we, we are very, very open to, to lots of different industries and use cases, but just thought it would be helpful to share uh, some of the customers we work with. Uh, a nice story here uh, is, is Chiroc. Um, so Chiroc actually utilized 3Kit to be able to provide more of a personal experience. So uh, for example, if you wanted to have a, a special wedding gift or a birthday gift or anniversary gift, um, perhaps you'd like to have more of a personal design uh, to a particular Chiroc bottle. Uh, so that's what they've utilized us for. We'll come on to some of these other customers very shortly as part of our demo and live experience. Okay, perfect. So one of the things that I think I would love you all to take away from today, if nothing else, 
is the power of um, the power of what a single model can do. So with three kits, we basically have the power to have one single model maximized to the to the advantage with maximum output. And what I mean by that is that you can have endless solutions and endless scenarios with the power of that single model. So if we take, for an example, um, a chair, a very simple chair, you can have that model of that chair rendered down into what we call 2D virtual photography. You can also have that same model in a 3D configurator, which is where you'd be able to have 3D rotation, you'd be able to have animation and explosion and have a much more interactive experience. And lastly, you're able to utilize that same model for augmented reality. Now, augmented reality um, can work very well in some industries. Others, it might take a little bit more time to, um, to get up to speed with, but we are um, working very, very closely with the market on augmented reality and which industries are suitable. Okay, so with regards to um, supporting your customers, if you're hearing of things around we're struggling because we have a lot of photography costs. Uh, we can't book out a studio. Uh, the costs are too high. It's very slow to turn things around. Or you're hearing of things around interest around 3D, uh, that they want customers may want to have more of a 3D interactive experience. They may want to uh, increase their customer experience or brand awareness on their commerce, on, on their e-commerce or indeed that they want to be able to have more of a, a real look and feel where customers may be able to just uh, drop a, a sofa or a table into their living space to see if it's the right fit. If you're hearing of some of these um, concerns or problems or challenges from your customers, then the, these are the signals or signs of where you would want to introduce us. So a little bit of background. Um, I am sure today, uh, even perhaps as we're going through this webinar, you will be uh, easily distracted by, vis <coughs> excuse me, by visuals, whether that be Facebook, whether that be LinkedIn, whether that be a text message, etc. Visuals are incredibly important in today's society, and it is so easy for us to be distracted by different visual experiences. In fact, up to 83% of buyers now say that images are the most inf influential factor when it comes to their purchasing decision. Of course, it is not the only decision. As you can see, you know, uh, descriptions and reviews are also very important, but it, it is incredibly important for businesses to now get this right and to get ahead of the game. Equally very important, there has been a change within the market over the years. So back in 2016, uh, it was seen that up to three images of a particular product would be acceptable uh, for a buyer to make a decision. What we're seeing now is a dramatic shift with that movement, and it is over doubled within three years. So it's a minimum now of eight images per product. And this, this is where it gets very interesting around having that 3D experience, because when you're able to fully rotate an image, and we'll come on to some examples of what that really means. You're getting more than eight images. You're getting a full product experience. So this is a little bit more of a fun exercise, but this is some of the traditional experiences of what customers come across today. Um, so this is a rather um, <laughs> um, look, old looking sofa. Um, hopefully you'll, you'll appreciate that when we come on to some of our examples very soon. Um, but this particular image does not provide full clarity and some customers may not appreciate, you know, what does the back look like? Am I able to extend uh, uh, the legs? Is it, is it extendable? What color different fabrics? What colors? What sizing? And so these types of questions, if they're not easily uh, shown or demonstrated, one could either delay a sale or it could um, ensure that a customer would just look elsewhere and be put off. So by having these visual experiences up front, it helps to, com it helps to convert customers much quicker helps to increase sales and build that customer experience. All right, so 
some of the areas that uh, have traditionally occurred would be um, more of a traditional photography approach or different types of 3D design. Now, these have always been, been great and there's always a place for these uh, types, of, types of solutions. However, what we're seeing is that it is not necessarily scalable and it is not going to provide uh, longer term results for, for our customers. So we can save significant costs uh, from having to, having to hire a studio, having to hire um, photography specialists. Um, and one of the biggest factors around this is logistical limitations. So a lot of customers that we talk to today um, may actually not be able to fully portray their whole portfolio on their website because it, it is just either too costly or it is logistically impossible. So if you consider, uh, for example, um, something that is more difficult to transport, maybe like tractors, for example, it would be a logistical nightmare to be able to provide every kind of uh, annotation around those tractors, any type of configuration possible. So with 3Kit, you're able to have a much more flexibility and be able to provide much more of variety uh, to your customers so that they can really see and have that visual experience, understand what, what it is that they're looking to purchase and be able to, to have that versatility. All right, so a little bit now about our platform. So typically um, we have quite a flexible approach when it comes to working with files. Uh, the reason I say this is that some customers today may already have some 3D files created um, using, using another technology, which is completely fine. We also have customers that uh, have no experience at all um, and don't have any type of 3D files at all. So what we would look to do is to support, so, sorry, say that again. What we would look to do, to do is support our customers with creating 3D models. So we can do that by a, a variety of different files, such as CAD, such as STEP, um, or indeed 3D file formats. Once we have those in place, obviously we can make tweaks and changes to ensure that the, the customer is happy with the quality uh, and how the actual model looks. And then we can look uh, to create rules uh, around how that, product, how that product is meant to work. So I know uh, there, I believe that there are several uh, attendees today that work for uh, CPQ companies. We actually look to uh, align closely with CPQ. Um, so we would look to uh, be the visual output of what is uh, selected within CPQ. Uh, we can always come onto that in more detail if anyone has any questions, but we see it as a very complementary solution, especially more for uh, B2B sales. Um, so once those rules are created, and for those that perhaps aren't as familiar uh, with configuration rules, uh, a very simple example, if we take a look at the, the sofa there on screen, um, there might be uh, different colors, different materials, different fabrics for um, uh, range A compared to range B. So you might want to have um, rules and conditions in place to ensure that the right fabrics and the right colors are associated to the correct range. That's a very simple example, uh, but hopefully everyone has a, a, a greater understanding. The last thing that I wanted to provide um, a, an introduction to was our reporting and analysis capability. So we see um, that it is really important for customers to be able to understand the popularity of their products. So if, for example, if I go back to that sofa example, um, maybe they're looking to have a red sofa and a blue sofa, and they want to understand uh, the, the popularity against those two products. So they can start, customers can then start to understand um, how many views and how many clicks um, their customers would be, would be taking a look. So they, the, the importance behind this is that those results can then feed back into the product team, to the design team, to the innovation team, um, and perhaps downstream more from a, a supply chain perspective. So if the red sofa is proving to be more popular than the blue sofa, perhaps um, additional supply needs to be put in place for that red sofa. So we're, we're kind of creating this, uh, this journey 
which helps towards having uh, an overall better experience. But 3Kit actually touches multiple different departments within a business and is, and is rather transformational across the board. So just wanted to briefly touch upon some of the results uh, that we've seen. Uh, there's lots more that we can help support on and we would be very happy to work uh, with customers on putting together unique ROIs. Um, but we're seeing results such as higher conversion rates by up to 40%. Uh, a significant drop when it comes to reducing photography because everything, uh, as I mentioned, would be in a digital studio rather than needing to use physical studios. Um, and the middle one here, a up to 80% reduction in returns. This is very interesting. Um, so what we're seeing is that a lot of uh, customers uh, today uh, the actual end customer, perhaps they look to buy um, two, three, four items, but with the intention of only keeping one. So there, there tends to be a, a high return, uh, return ratio. And so this can be quite problematic for our customers um, and obviously can have quite significant costs associated with, uh, with processing that. So it, it's quite an important area that we see for, for, some, of our, for some of our customers and industries. All right, and last but not least, um, just before we dive into, into the demos and uh, the live experiences, why partner with 3Kit? So first and foremost, um, we are um, a, a first of a kind technology within this space. You may have heard of others in this space. There may be um, other, other smaller players, but we provide um, rather a different approach um, which we'd be very happy to, to go through in a deeper dive with you, but hopefully you'll get a sense of that with, uh, with the demos that we provide very shortly. We also believe that it will expand your scopes and your discussions and relationships with your customers, um, helping to build, build, build momentum um, over time. And of course, simply reduce costs. And this is always something that customers love to hear. Um, so I will just uh, take a pause and stop sharing my screen and um, we'll just do a check if there are any questions, which I don't believe there are for, for now, which is, which is fine. So just while we uh, transition over, my colleague Phil is now going to walk through some, some examples. Um, just before we get started, if you can consider there are lots of different parts of the business that 3Kit can touch and we'll look to show you um, different examples of 2D, of 3D uh, interactivity, and if we get some time, some AR as well. Thank you so much. Great. Great. Thanks, Katie. Uh, again, my name is Phil Bradison. I'm a member of the solution engineering team here with 3Kit. Uh, I'll be walking through a variety of illustrations today to hopefully leave everybody on the call more educated about uh, what 3Kit's all about. Um, you know, there have been some subtle changes that have been happening in the market. Um, and I think we've, we've all sort of seen this happening in the background, but it's, uh, you know, been happening so gradually that there's been a major shift that um, has occurred sort of while we've all been just, you know, living our day to day. So the statistic that I always like to call out, and this actually came home uh, literally for me uh, actually this morning, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell that story in a second, but, um, even just three years ago, uh, consumers were seeing a product image before they purchased uh, three times, or they were seeing three different product images of the product they were going to buy before they made that purchase. Um, in the last three years, that number has grown to over eight images. And, you know, if you think about why that's occurring, I think it should be fairly obvious. You know, we're all on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Reddit, whatever your preferred platform is constantly all day. And, that's kind of creating these habits and these expectations of uh, people in their consumer lives to be able to really uh, visually understand the product in a more meaningful way than uh, ever before. Um, so this shift is, as I don't think there's been one thing that's happened. It's, it's sort of been an accumulation of things that have occurred. And with 3Kit, essentially what we're trying to do is allow our customers, uh, people that are making products, generally people that are making products that are customizable or configurable, allowing them to generate uh, whatever type of visual content they need to facilitate their selling process. Um, so this manifests itself for us in a variety of ways, and I'll be showing a number of illustrations today to kind of highlight some of those things. 
But again, what 3Kit's really all about is, is managing that visual customer experience. Uh, from when the customer is first going to an e-commerce platform or, or, or reading a brochure about a product, seeing some maybe hero shots of the product in action, uh, to when the customer is getting a little bit more serious about making a purchasing decision, maybe they're online. Uh, in this case here, if you're buying a football helmet, sort of a consumer product, uh, this is going to be more of an e-commerce motion uh, where you're actually wanting to touch and feel and then configure and customize and personalize. Uh, all the way through when you want to actually make that purchase, maybe you want to see it in your room before, uh, uh, you, know, before you know, before pulling the trigger and pulling out your credit card uh, through AR. So, um, yeah, perfect. So that's really what we're about is, is, is managing that entire visual experience life cycle. So, you know, you know, kind of an interesting thing happened to me about 20 minutes ago. My wife uh, recently purchased a hoodie online. It's, it's becoming fall here very quickly, and so the temperature uh, is, uh, is, is rapidly declining in Chicago, Illinois, where I'm broadcasting from. Uh, and the hoodie she bought didn't have a back, which was sort of interesting. I guess it was a, it was a fashion, it was a very stylish hoodie, apparently. Um, but ultimately, because she wasn't able to see that hoodie online in a, in a, in, in a meaningful way, she purchased something that wasn't going to meet her use case. And I was thinking about that a little bit more deeply here just as I was preparing for the presentation. And I was, you know, really thinking that that was one, that it sort of dawned on me that that was one of the main reasons why uh, people that sell configurable or relatively complex products haven't been able to adopt digital commerce uh, in the same way that consumer brands have, right? So here in this case, if you're buying a football helmet, you know, there's a lot that's going into this. You want to make sure the football helmet's safe. So you want to be able to make sure that, that it's, it's thick, uh, that the padding is thick enough. You want to make sure that it's going to be comfortable. You might have specific things that are important to you as a buyer that maybe aren't important to everybody else. You know, for instance, maybe I was playing a football game three or four years ago and I broke one of the straps on my helmet and I had to sit the rest of the game out. Not a very common occurrence maybe, but for me personally, that's hugely important. Now, every single time I buy a football helmet, I'm going to make sure the haps, the straps aren't too close together so that if one breaks, I can still kind of use it maybe. I don't know, that might be a silly example. But allowing customers to visualize the product in you know, a variety of contexts, in this case here with interactive 3D, allowing the buyer or in the case of like a CPQ sales motion, allowing the sales rep or dealer or partner to visualize and interact with the product as if they were in store uh, or actually you know, sitting there with the product is, is one of the elements here that we introduce, and that is going, to be redu is going to be to increase the buyer's confidence and ultimately education about what the product can do or their, their understanding of what the product can do, rather. You know, so right out of the gates, their visuals are extremely important. And you know, with 3Kid, I would say there's, there's sort of two key pillars. There's the visual experience that you can create. And unfortunately, we're broadcasting this over a Zoom uh, WebEx meeting or web conference tool, excuse me. Uh, so we lose some visual quality, but you know, 3Kit's really known for being able to deliver extremely high levels of visual fidelity uh, in their experiences. That's the first pillar. And the second pillar is product configuration. So being able to take that same level of visual fidelity, but allow the customer to configure the product and see exactly what they're going to get uh, while they're making a purchase or while they're putting this together. Or in the case of, a, uh, of, of, of someone who's selling uh, maybe a more complex machine or a medical device or something along those lines, you know, being able to actually see what that particular product looks like that they're building as they're going through the process is one of the ways that you simply simplify uh, the whole, whole experience here. Great, right, so just getting kicked off here with 3Kit. Uh, again, in this experience, we have an interactive 3D configurator, so I can obviously rotate this around, but we can also begin to manipulate the product in literally any way that you would be able to manipulate this product in the traditional 3D editing or a CAD system. Okay. So I can change geometries. Here we have a variety of different parts that I'm swapping in and out. So I'm changing the face mask. Uh, we can change materials or we can change colors and style the product, obviously. We can even apply different visual effects techniques uh, to give the product and highlight certain aspects of the product uh, that are important. So here I have this mirrored eye shell visor. So as I kind of begin to rotate this around, you'll notice that the colors are, are, are kind of shifting. 
So these are minor details, but ultimately as a, as a as a consumer especially, but even a sales rep who's 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 selling a medical device or who's selling some kind of a complex um, you know, some kind of a complex machine, being able to see those intricate details as you're building this is gonna go a long way to communicating what the product is all about and giving you as a as a buyer or as as a potential customer, um, you know, that confidence that you need to actually make a transaction. Uh, but beyond that, you can also do other things as well. And this is where I think I would get excited about 3Kit. Uh, in almost every single one of our customer engagements, there's a new use case that somebody thinks up almost in the room. And they're all extremely valuable um, and valuable in different ways. So for instance, here with this helmet, so Zenith um, has patented technology uh, for how they prevent concussions. So they have this whole internal shock system They've actually sponsored a few medical studies uh, to, to prove how their shock system not only um, 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 prevents concussions in a much more effective way, but does so in a way that's much lighter for the, uh, 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 the uh, player who's, who's, who's wearing a helmet, which is more comfortable for them and ultimately better. Now, if you're thinking about how you would sell something like that in a traditional e-commerce experience, it's, it's quite difficult, right? You have images of the outside of the helmet. You can't really see the, in, the innards or how the product works. And so you're very limited and constrained in, in, in what you can show the customer and, and what you can explain to the customer. So with 3Kit, you can begin to do creative things. In this case here, we can have this product explosion where we're taking the, the helmet, we're sort of breaking out all the different pieces and the parts. And so the buyer is able to see what really makes the helmet special. And that's this internal shock system in here. Again, we have use cases where customers are using this for spare parts ordering. So you have a really complex machine or, or, or maybe even just even a simple chair and you want to order this new thing. Well, if there's not a serial number on that thing, it, it could be quite confusing for you to order the correct part for that particular application. So again, with visualization, you're able to kind of unlock a lot of these um, um, different avenues uh, to simplify the experience and thus make it much more powerful. As you're, as you're going about that. Perfect. Great. So again, this is sort of a simple example I like to start with just to you know, showcase and kind of level set on some of the things that are kind of happening with 3Kit and especially with this experience. Um, a few subtle things here that may be happening uh, that you may be noticing that are happening in the background are more traditional product configuration and more traditional e-commerce functionality related uh, 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 type of type of functionality, excuse me. So you'll notice here as I'm making different selections, we're keeping track of the SKU that this product represents. Uh, if I add some accessories down here, like this sleeve, we now are keeping track of, of that individual item as a separate line. Um, so not only is 3Kit going to allow you to uh, visualize what the customer is going to buy, but you're, you're also keeping track of everything that you need to keep track of to either populate a quote or to uh, you know, populate an e-commerce cart or whatever it might be. So again, it's not just about the visual experience here, it's also about um, you know, more of the traditional product configuration type of, 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 of value where you're able to you know, make sure that the order is correct on the back end. Uh, and last but not least here, just while I'm uh, on this example, over here on the left, we have these presets. And so this is sort of an interesting application. It's something that, that um, uh, I, I, you know, has a variety of different applications for customers. But in, in this illustration here, uh, essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking our most popular configurations and I'm simply exposing them as kind of high level starting points or what we call presets. So these presets allow you to kind of inspire the customer, show them a few way, different ways the product, the, the product is, that the product can be configured. Um, so if a customer comes to the site and maybe I'm a linebacker and I see uh, I want this helmet because that's the kind of helmet that a linebacker wants to use, uh, you don't have to go and tediously select every single option. You can sort of start here at a high level. And so what's interesting about 3Kit is we're capturing the analytics about what products have been configured, what options are selected together, what, what things are, are most commonly associated. And so what we're doing is we're allowing our customers to kind of take a step back after they've had something in place for a while, uh, analyze the information, and then ultimately put something relevant on their site uh, here. So you can, over time, build up sort of this 
uh, analytics base on what customers have configured, what, what options are selected together, and then ultimately use that to drive, in this case here, presets. But I've also seen this be used in things like a wish list or a, uh, an apparel for, for our apparel companies. There's a concept of like a storybook where you have different you know, styles and suit cuts and depending on the event you're going to, maybe you want to have a different configuration or different items or different, you know, colored pants with, with, a, with a jacket or something like that. Um, again, a lot of flexibility here, but ultimately at the end of the day, the functionality that we're delivering um, allows you to manage those things. Anything that has to do with the visual customer experience is really going to be well within our domain. Phil, just to interject, we've had one question. Um, can 3Kit be used with Adobe CC? Uh, so, um, Adobe Experience Manager? Yes. Uh, so, actually, so yes. Um, in fact, in, in, the, in the next illustration I'll go to here, um, one of our customers, Crate and Barrel, has actually done exactly that. So, we've, we've essentially uh, have, have, have taken the, the final result of, 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 of the three kit visual platform and we've injected that into, uh, into Adobe experience manager or scene seven, uh, so that they can then service their content in a standard way. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain that here in just a second. I'll make sure I touch on that. Any other questions at this point, Katie? Uh, that's all that's on the chat. Thank you. Great. Oh, perfect. So just sort of moving along here. Um, again, what I, what, I, what I showed you a second ago was an interactive 3D example. And, and with 3Kit, we're always going to start with some kind of a 3D representation of the product. That's, that's kind of the core element of, of what makes all this possible. But once we have that asset in our platform, we have a number of other things that, the, that, 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 that our customers can leverage uh, from that asset. So here for Crate and Barrel, um, they want to give their customers the illusion that what they're looking at is actually a real photograph. But I hate to break it to you if you're a Crate and Barrel fan, 95% um, of what you've been looking at online are not pictures, uh, not physical photographs at least. These are all renders that have been taken with the three kit virtual photographer. So essentially what we're doing here is we're taking that same product that we would have, that same model, so in these, this case, these couches or sofas, uh, and we're taking the configurations of those sofas and we're rendering them out using a, a, a technology called V-Ray. And I won't go too much into the weeds there, but it's essentially the industry gold standard for photorealistic rendering. So if you're doing some high-end visual effects production, you're almost certainly going to use V-Ray uh, at some point in your process to, to create kind of these realistic images. And so here, uh, and it's interesting you brought up Scene 7 or excuse me, Adobe Experience Manager, um, because specifically um, what we do here is we essentially take all these renders and when they're generated with 3Kit, they're fully tagged. And since they're fully tagged, we can automatically port those over to Scene 7. And so there's no manual uploading, no, no, one, you know, no, no one in the back office kind of tagging or, or, or trying to associate these pictures. Everything is just automatically updated uh, in Scene 7, and then it can be served up uh, appropriately. So that's kind of how they're leveraging us here. But something that's interesting here that you'll maybe be noticing, it's, it's kind of subtle as I'm, as I'm scrolling down this, you know, giant list of, 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 of renders here, that, you know, we have obviously the sofa in this case, that's, that's you know, that's, that's part of the image, but everything you're seeing in here is actually a 3D scene, or is actually it's just a 3D model. So the background, the floor, uh, everything about these renders is, is all managed in 3Kit. And so what's interesting about this, if you, if you start to think of, of, of how, you're, how you would generate content for uh, a brand, um, you know, you're going to want to make sure, number one, you're controlling the creative direction of all of your content. But equally important, you want to make sure that the images that are coming out look good, <laughs> obviously. So here, in this case, I have this... Uh, uh, I guess this, this, this bench, I suppose. And you'll notice it's got sort of, you know, this a green color and then some, and kind of a natural base, but it's kind of a, a hardwood. So we want to uh, accentuate this particular product image with kind of this marble floor and a natural colored background. But as I'm sort of scrolling up here, we have another soap or another bench here, if you will. Uh, and we have a lighter background, but then a more naturally colored 
uh, less reflective floor. So essentially what we're doing is we're allowing our customers' creative teams to have, a, uh, have much more control and much more creative direction uh, over their content than they would ever be able to uh, accomplish with traditional photography or with trying to do this um, just with you know, traditional rendering or anything along those lines. And so, my, and so in, in my humble opinion, I think where this really starts to become valuable is not only when you think about how uh, to generate this content, right? I mean, just simply generating photos for all of Crate and Barrel's product catalog uh, is pretty much logistically impossible with physical photography. They have over two and a half million variations of their products. So you would have to manufacture a poster, ship, photo, excuse me, photograph, uh, Photoshop, you know, there's a whole process that, that would go into each one of these and it would simply be impossible. So even that initial list is very difficult, but where things begin to really break down uh, is when you think about how this content needs to be maintained over time. So think about going through the project at somebody at Crate and Barrel of photographing all of your, all of your sofas and then somebody on the product team says, hey, we have a new fabric that we want to release in, you know, fall 20." or spring 2020 or whatever, right? So next year we're preparing for our catalog and we have a new uh, fabric we want to apply to, you know, maybe 10,000 different sofas. <laughs> Simply doing that with physical photography would again require you to go through that whole manual effort. But with 3Kit, all you have to do is come into the, the back end of the 3Kit platform, upload your material. You'll simply tag that material, which is sort of how we uh, associate things here on the back end. Um, and once it's tagged, we'll be able to generate all of that content that needs to be generated to maintain the catalog. So I've gone ahead of added a new fabric and boom, within a matter of a day or two, we have a brand new, we have all of the images for every single product automatically updated in scene seven uh, so that they can then be served up uh, accordingly. Phil, sorry to interject, yep. it's a quick question. Um, how long is the production time for an existing product and do you need to have a physical copy of that product to be able to digitize it? Uh, no, so you don't have to have a physical copy of the product. Um, in the case of someone like Crate and Barrel uh, for a sofa, for instance, they almost certainly have manufacturing CAD files laying around somewhere um, or at some point in their process. So the 3Kit platform is very good about ingesting those files. Um, I won't go too much into the backstory of the platform, but that's actually one of the core pillars of, of, of the initial uh, 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 technology that Ben Houston and his team were, were developing. Um, so you simply import your files. There's a bit of artistic, uh, um, you know, elbow grease that gets put onto it. Uh, but once it's in the platform, you can uh, uh, basically generate these automatically. So there's no physical samples that are needed. Uh, and in the case here where we're just simply adding new fabric, the time to generate new content would basically be whatever the amount of time it is to render the products. So if you're rendering, let's say 10,000 products, that'll probably take, I don't know, maybe, you know, half a day, you know, so basically hit render and then go to sleep and wake up in the morning and they'll be done. Uh, any other questions? Perfect. A any other questions? If anyone has any questions on uh, photorealistic rendering, please um, put them in the uh, chat forum. This was an item that was new to me personally. I spent my career primarily in, you know, traditional product configuration. Um, but when you really start to think about how products, how having configurable products creates challenges in other verticals and, and, and creates challenges beyond just the quoting process for these customers, um, you know, it's, this is, this, is a, this, is a, this is a fairly major one. Uh, and this is one of the things that I've, I've really liked about being on the, uh, on, uh, as a sales engineer here with, with 3Kit is a lot of times in our opportunities where we're replacing substantial photography budgets. So, you know, seven figure photography budgets go from, you know, are, are reduced sometimes 95%. So there's a huge cost savings, which <laughs> frankly for me, it, it makes my job very easy. Um, on top of all the value you get, there's, very hard met they're very hard and uh, easy, to, easy to define metrics. Great. So last but not least here, I will uh, go ahead and 
show one more example here. Uh, so I'll show one more illustration of, of a different type of experience, then I'll hop over to a few um, uh, examples where I think for those, of, you know, for those folks in the line who, who have a CPQ background will be very relevant. I'll focus uh, a good portion of the time after this one uh, on how visualization simplifies the quoting process and the product configuration process. Uh, great, but last but not least, um, so with 3Kit, you can also take advantage of other technologies that are rapidly innovating. So here, what we have is uh, an augmented reality uh, uh, demonstration. <laughs> so with 3Kit, we can take the same products that we already have defined, the same virtual assets we have on the 3Kit platform, and we can allow you to create augmented reality experiences or virtual reality experiences or really whatever content is going to come out in the future we're going to be able to support those file format types. And so our customers can create AR experiences for not just one or two or three of their products, but literally across their entire product catalog. Uh, this is to create this demo. It was literally a click of the button. I already had an espresso machine uh, and I clicked one button and was able to generate it. So one quick uh, point here before I actually show the AR, I'll, I'll, I'll highlight here is I'm, I'm just on a simple web browser. So this is an important, uh, item here to understand about the, uh, you know, about the, um, I would say the strategy behind our, our augmented, our augmented reality strategy. And that's that a company like 3Kit or, or, you know, really any company that's, that's not on the level of an Apple or a Google or a Facebook or someone of that magnitude is simply not going to be able to innovate uh, in the AR space as rapidly as those major hardware vendors. And so our approach here is to make our customers compatible with whatever comes out in the future. So here, Apple released a uh, file format called USDZ sometime last year, or almost two, two years ago now. And so anybody that's, that has an iOS device uh, that you've purchased in the last three years will be able to use, uh, will be able to take uh, basic, will be able to see things in AR from any web browser. Uh, Google came out with something that's actually more advanced than what Apple came out with. They came out with it earlier this year. So now anybody in an Android device can do the same thing. Facebook has a new platform out that, that's, that, that's, I think, very interesting for customers in apparel. You can have like Snapchat-like filters and things like that. So if you want to see sunglasses on your face, you know, you don't have to write a custom app. Facebook has the technology and infrastructure behind it. So it's very seamless. So again, I'm just on a simple web page here. And I can go ahead and click on my product and rotate this around and then let's go ahead and project that directly in my room. There we go. So I can go ahead and rotate the product around. You'll notice that things like, um, uh, you know, transparencies, reflections, all of that are maintained. This is actually very interesting. When I built this demo, if you notice here, we have some, uh, uh, some reflections that are occurring Kind of on the side of it. So notice this is kind of a little bit wider than this part up here. When I built this demo, there were no real-time reflections. That functionality did not exist with Apple's USDZ format when it first came out. But since Apple, since we're just simply piggybacking on, on whatever they're doing, um, my demo was improved automatically. I guess they released a new software update and uh, now all of my demos have real-time reflections. Um, so you know, again, this is just going to keep getting better and better. Um, I think the biggest ROI that we've seen, the most tangible examples for augmented reality uh, have been in return rate reductions, frankly. Um, you know, so for customers that are about to buy an end table, they want to see how big that end table is uh, next to their sofa, things like that. Being able to actually see the item contextually um, prevents return rates at a rate of somewhere between 30 and 50%. So for people that are uh, uh, viewing something in AR before making that purchase decision, uh, 20 to, excuse me, uh, th 30 to 50%, there we go, 30 to 50% less likely to return that product. Uh, and that's been consistent. We have Crate and Barrel has done some pretty extensive AB split tests as well as some of our other customers. And that's generally what we're seeing is somewhere in that range, at least on that metric. But there's, again, going to be a lot more different, um, many more to come many more tangible examples to come in that regard. Perfect. Great. Uh, perfect. So um, I, I'll, I've got about five minutes here. I'll, I'll run through a few examples really quick. Um, and, you know, this is, and these examples here at the end are, are near and dear to my heart. Um, 
you know, having been uh, in the product configuration space, working with traditional configurators without visualization for quite some time, you know, there are always use cases that were notoriously difficult for us to manage. Uh, so here is a great example. Boston Tech is one of our customers. Again, this isn't meant to be a, a, a really visually appealing demonstration. This is more meant to be representative, right? We're, we're configuring a workbench here. And so for those of you uh, who have worked with traditional product configurators, I just want you to maybe close your eyes and, and think about uh, uh, what it would be like to try to build something like this in a traditional configurator. So I'm adding different uprights. Uh, I can add accessories to those. We have different attach points, so we need to keep track of the position of where this falls. You'll notice here for this particular upright, we have two different rows. But if I go ahead and if I select a different upright, our single bay, we only have a single row. So now we have to keep track of that on that single plane as opposed to those two different planes. Um, so here. Uh, we have some rules in place that are governing how things can and can't overlap. So if I drag this guy down and I add another one, uh, you'll see here I'm not able to obviously overlap this. I can either go below it or above it. I can't obviously put this, you know, over another item because there's a physical geometric limitation there. Uh, and then you even have additional items here where we've added a shelf and now we have to keep track of the position of items that are attaching to that shelf. And again, all of this is pretty much impossible, and I think this is a good example of, of where traditional configuration tools really begin to break down. Um, and that's not any fault of, the, of anybody who designed those, uh, you know, any, that's not a design fault. It's just simply a reality of not having, you know, the concept of geometry, the concept of the model inside of the configurator and really married up with those things. Um, so here in this case, what, what we would do is, is um, uh, uh, you know, allow some, a much simpler or make this type of a use case possible. One thing I always like to note here, whenever we're talking about configuration, it's really important that uh, configuration rules are managed centrally with whatever configurator we're integrating to, and that's something that we deeply believe in. Uh, so in almost all of our CPQ implementations, I would say at least 95% of the rules are managed in a CPQ solution. In fact, any rule that you would be able to build inside of a CPQ application would be managed inside of that CPQ application. 3Kit is simply going to take whatever the final result is and then visualize that. The only time that we would ever have any kind of a rule inside of 3Kit is if there was a substantial uh, complexity reduction. Uh, so if in this case here, we have these attach points and we're dragging and dropping and you have to keep you know, track of all of these different positions. Something like this, again, pretty much impossible with the traditional configurator. This might be an example of where we have some basic visual attach point rules in 3Kit, but then again, 95% at least of those rules are going to be managed in the CPQ application. It's a very clean architecture at the end of the day, uh, and that's something that we uh, are, are very adamant about here, uh, really throughout the business. Um, again, other applications here begin to manifest themselves when we start talking through how we maybe calculate price based on overall material. So again, try to think about building out a pricing rule where you have to calculate the total volume of material used and you have an angle, right? You're going to have to dust off that old sophomore year geometry book and, you know, figure out the arc tangent of cosine squared of the material. It's just not going to really be an effective way to build something out. Um, in other areas here too, as well, and this is maybe moving away more now from CPQ, but personalization. Again, this is a very big trend we're seeing, uh, allowing customers to really personalize their products in a meaningful way. Um, actually has quite a few applications in, in uh, configurators. Um, surprisingly, I've been shocked at how many customers want to uh, actually personalize their products in a B2B context. One example is a, a dental drill bit manufacturer that we are working with and they wanted to allow these dentists to add their name and logo to a dental drill bit box. Uh, apparently it's a big deal when you get a hundred different tiny drill bit boxes back from the cleaners. You need to be able to find which one, one is yours and which procedure it's for. And so simply being able to add that etch in engraving allows them to uh, have a differentiator as well as capture additional revenue through um, you know, a value proposition that costs them basically nothing. Great, so I went through quite a bit. I hope that wasn't too much, but I suppose I'll come up for air now and uh, you know, pause for questions and, and, and uh, you know, pass it over to Katie after we get to those.
Yep, there's, there's two questions. Um, so the first one is um, approximately how long does it take? Uh, sorry, let me start again and <laughs> get my words up. Uh, approximately how long is the time for a new CAD uh, product to, to final image? So, so if, yeah, so it, it, so it's, it's a difficult question to answer directly and I'll explain why. So the efficiencies that our customers gain with 3 kit are really had uh, through economies of scale. So if, if you're doing a single product, uh, there, you know, you're gonna import the file, you're going to apply materials to it, you're going to do some things to optimize it. Depending on how complex that product is, you're probably looking at, I don't know, a couple of days if, if you have no CAD file, right? If you have nothing to start with. Um, that being said, after you've gone through that process of creating the materials, for example, with 3 kit, you never have to do that again. So if I've created, like here in this case of Crate and Barrel, I've, you know, they've created materials. And once that material for this upholstery here has been created, you can simply apply that across your entire product catalog. So with the first one, that's gonna be the least efficient product you ever do. But then as you're adding new items, it, it, it increasingly diminishes for each individual element, if that makes sense. Kind of like a, you know, d diminishing marginal uh, cost, if you will, from, yeah, anyway. Perfect, thank you. And the, the last question we have at the moment is, can 3Kit read configuration rules from uh, PIMS or ERPs? So almost 100% of our customers are driving their uh, products uh, and option availability from an external data source. So we are always integrating with some external system. Um, in the case of a PIM or an ERP system, uh, generally we're going to be driving products, optionality. If there, are, if there are, are rules, simple constraints like this can't show with that, those can be pulled in as well. Now, when we get into more complex logic, like when uh, this is m maybe beyond the scope of the question, but um, when we're talking about product configurators, our approach to integrating with a true product configurator like a Salesforce CPQ or a Big Machines or an Aptis um, is we're not going to attempt to convert or translate or transcode any of the rules from that system. Essentially what we're going to do is become a dumb visualizer. So we're going to have the assets, the options, the materials, the visual uh, uh, elements defined in tree kit. And then we're going to take whatever the final configured result is and then visualize that for the customer. So the integration is actually much easier when there's a configurator in place or, or some system that, that, that has those rules. And hopefully that, uh, answers the question and let me know if there's uh, any more detail you want on that this uh, can be a you know fairly in-depth topic perfect there, there's one other question um but phil maybe if you could stop sharing your screen and i'll just go to my last slide um and we'll try and cover the the last question in conjunction with uh, with closing as well so let me just go here so the last question um, was, can you set uh, spacing constraints, for example, with room sizing? 100%. Uh, um, in fact, I was uh, ran out of time. I was going to show an example of exactly that. Um, and it's very simple to do so. Um, and maybe that'll be a question we take offline. But yes, you can have collision rules and proximity rules. You, you, can, you can get pretty creative with, with how you're uh, applying them. Perfect, thank you. Um, if there are any other questions, then please feel free to, to share them now. Um, but just in the meantime, we'll, we're very, very grateful for everyone that's taken the time to, to join us today. Um, I personally would love a little bit of feedback. Um, so the, the good, the bad and the ugly so that we know what to do better for next time. Um, so I'll be looking to share a very short survey um, a, an hour or so after, the, after, this, uh, after this meeting. If you wouldn't mind taking the time, I'd be very grateful. Um, if, you have, if you have any other questions or would like any further information, uh, please feel free to reach out to myself or Lauren and our email addresses are, are there at the bottom. Just a quick check, um, any further questions? Oops, sorry, I will stop sharing my screen. I don't think there are any further questions, so we will stop uh, the, the meeting for now. Thank you so much for everyone that's joined us. 
uh, look forward to speaking with you soon. Have an enjoyable rest of the day. Bye-bye. Cheers.